This episode of Everything Went Black is dedicated to the memory of Blake Harrison. I'm back. Apologies for last week. I had intended on posting this episode last week, but when I got home, I got hit with uh, one of the most brutal colds that uh, I'd experienced in quite a while, and I was unable to record the intro. And uh, Dawn of the Dead requires a lot of introduction because, in my opinion, he's a true legend in the uh, U.S. black metal scene. But uh, I'm feeling a little bit better. As you can tell, my voice is still not 100%. Somewhere in the barren wastes of Canada, I picked up something. And it uh, stuck with me over those last few days. The Canadian dates, Boston, and in Brooklyn. And it was uh, a mighty blow. I had to conserve every bit of energy just to make it through the set. And uh, when I got home, I got hit really hard. You know, pretty much put me on my ass all week. <laughs> that didn't stop me from going to work, though. Um, <laughs> uh, which um, some of you guys know, my uh, professional career has uh, had some changes. And um, now I'm back at my former employer, happier than ever. Uh, looking forward to that chapter uh, you know, starting that new chapter with that old company. And um, yeah, I don't know. Since I've gotten back from tour, I've been very optimistic. A lot of good stuff happening in the future. Um, some of it is related to this podcast and Necromaniacs. And uh, I'm just like really looking forward to getting back to work, getting back to the grind, and start making content for you guys again. Uh, I hope you enjoyed some of the um, material that originally appeared on the Patreon stream. And maybe that would encourage some of you guys to join Patreon and um, get into some of the stuff we got cooking over there. We got a lot of cool stuff going on there. You know, that, that's, some of a, that's sort of an introduction to that world. But uh, yeah, Pro Fanatica and Nun Slaughter. Some of the oldest original bands in American black metal. And uh, you know, especially Pro Fanatica, our architects of the USBM sound. And uh, I got to tell you, man, it was uh, really an honor to be out on the road with these guys, watching them play every night. And uh, Don, very cool guy. Uh, we hit it off immediately. Uh, we share a lot of the same interests when it comes to music and films. And I figured it would be a, uh, a slam dunk to have him on the podcast and uh we talked about doing a part two i mean that's the thing you're out on the tour doing out on the trail with these guys and uh, you think it'd be easy to find some time to sit down and talk but it's not the case all the time you just kind of catch each other here and there you know because with uh load in you know sound checks when these guys are done we're doing our thing you gotta hustle you know, otherwise, uh, you know, every day is almost pretty much the same. But uh, we're very, very rarely in the same place at the same time until the show starts. So uh, I was able to catch up with Don at uh, the Quebec City show. And um, it was a lot of fun. Uh, we had enough space between the green room and the, and the show space where, you know, noise wasn't so much of an issue. But uh, yeah, I had, a, I had a great time. And I, I'm definitely going to hold Don to doing a part two and um i feel like we we just touched the surface of this uh epic conversation and um some of the stuff we didn't record i wish had made it into the episode unfortunately but yeah um 
I also want to uh, mention that on this outing, I got a chance to meet a lot of you guys in person, and that was a great, great honor as well. Uh, you know, some of you guys have been listening to the show for a while, the show as well as Necromaniacs, and it's nice to, you know, put a face to that. So I just want to shout out a couple of you guys. We got uh, Dave Metal Leader, Andre, Todd, and Tavis from Pittsburgh. Those are only the guys that introduced themselves to me. There was a dude in Atlanta that I ran into on the way in. Uh, I didn't catch his name or, I didn't, you know, it was loud and uh, hard to understand. But, you know, please, man, hit me up. It was great meeting you. And, um, and yeah, I look forward to all this stuff, man. This is like one of the coolest things about doing the podcast is meeting people in person and um, putting a human element to all this stuff. Because, hey, man, this is, this is, a, this is a passion project. You know, I do this out of love, and um, I'm glad that you guys appreciate this stuff and are getting something out of it. So before we get going, I want to give the rundown of the elite podcasting Illuminati. Of course, I'm referring to the horsemen of the podcasting apocalypse. These are my brothers in arms. We have this group of elite men engaged in creating incredible content for you guys. It's a war against mediocrity. So kicking things off, we've got Brandon Legion bringing you Horror Wolf 666. Up next is Jackie Smith's Into the Necrosphere, the finest metal podcast on the internet. Of course, Wednesday is um, Everything Went Black. I come back the sec- next day on Thursday for Necromaniacs along with Mike Scandato and Jeff Kashid. Friday is Spitball Media featuring Mike's brother, John Draper. Saturday is a day off. However, Sunday, we come back with The Vengeance. Soul Knox, brought to you by Carl Hikara. Carl actually posts episodes on Thursdays and Sundays, so he's giving you the double duty every week. And um, as you guys know, Carl and I are engaged deeply in this Darkness Weaves project which is bringing you the work of Carl Edward Wagner, creator of Kane, next to Conan, one of the greatest dark sorcery fantasy characters there is. One of my favorites. Uh, We finished up In a Lonely Place, a collection of short stories that was brought to us by Valancourt Books and was out of print for many years. So uh, that is a collaboration We switch each month between Solnox and Everything Went Black. And I believe this month, the uh, Darkness Weaves episode will be on Solnox. And uh, the newest and one of the more diligent members of the Horsemen is out there, Iblis Manifestations, brought to you by Cheyenne of the great band Trivax. And that's it, man. You got all the bases covered. All you got to do is stay with us. And you'll you'll be okay. You won't have any any issues <laughs> moving forward with bad content if you just listen to our shows. And I mentioned the Patreon. So for as little as one dollar a month, you can support the show, get access to bonus content. For five dollars a month, you get access to the bonus content plus early access to all the episodes. Now I know I'm behind, but one of my uh, you know new new commitments now that I'm back from tour is to start banking up episodes again and I'm going to get it ahead and if you're at the five dollar level you'll get unfettered access to all the content as it's posted and if you want to support the the show in other ways you can just uh, you know share it on social media tell your friends about it word of mouth is always the best way So anyway, here we go. We got Dawn of the Dead of the Mighty Nun Slaughter. We're in the lovely uh, Canadian night freezing. It's uh, probably like three degrees outside. About three degrees, Quebec City. And this is our our day two of the tour in Canada, the leg of the tour, the Canadian leg of the tour. And um, playing the show tonight. And uh, I got to tell you, Dawn, um, when I first started getting the black metal in the early 90s, uh, I used to think that you know, it was a European thing only. And then I discovered all these bands uh, that were based in the U.S. 
and uh, of course, you know, Vaughn, uh, Hemlock from New York, and Nunslaughter. Yeah. Was a band oh, that cool. I started checking out when I first and realized that it was more of just not just a European thing, but an American thing. Mm. And then I realized that you guys have been at it since the late 80s. Yeah, long time. Yeah, so. <laughs> Originally you're from Pittsburgh, so that's where the band started, right? Yeah, correct. And what was the, uh, did you start out wanting to be black metal? Was that something you picked up from listening to like Venom and like Bathory or sort of, what was like <clears throat> the, gener the generation of the whole thing? Well, I mean, uh, I, I, we always considered ourselves uh, a death metal band. Okay. Um, and that came from the punk roots of what, uh, how we wrote the songs, um, they were just structured like punk songs right. and it the reason they were uh, uh, structured that way is because we couldn't play our instruments I know that's really <laughs> so, <laughs> so uh, we, we were kids I mean the only reason I got the gig as the bass player as the original bass player was that a friend of mine uh, Ted Williams from the band Dream Death gave me a free bass that may be the bass, uh, qualified me to be the bass player because I had a bass. That's <laughs> so. kind of how it worked back then. It's like it's the guy with the van was like, you know, in the band because he had a van. Right. Like, yeah. Well, that's how Ozzy got the gig as, as that, a vocalist. That, he, had a, he, had a PA. <laughs> he had a PA. He had a PA, so he became a singer. <laughs> so, yeah. uh, but yeah, we we always considered ourselves a, a death metal band. But back then, there wasn't, um, there weren't so many lines uh, for different genres it was kind of all just considered death metal and then I guess Venom with the black metal and, and uh, you know album but uh, they were even though it said black metal they were on new wave British heavy metal yeah, comps yeah, yeah, so exactly. to me it was they were like British heavy metal yeah. but they talked about Satan and most of the British heavy metal didn't they had a little dark stuff but not as deep as Venom went so we always considered ourselves a, a, a death metal band, but um, more and more people are, have put us in a black metal uh, genre, I guess. Uh, but I'm sticking with death metal. Yeah. <laughs> we'll see what happens. I don't know. Yeah. You know? Yeah, no, it's interesting it's because, you know, the, the blasphemous nature of the material and, like, the imagery and all that sort of stuff. But then again, you know, there's a lot of death metal that has a lot of blasphemy associated with it, too. Well, there was something... There was there was backlash in the uh, early, mid-'90s. Uh, from what I remember, the uh, death metal bands were almost... It was uh, almost too cliche to sing about Satan. So they started doing different things, uh, more themes about uh, uh, war and struggle and uh, strife and uh, other topics other than yeah. uh, death and Satan. <clears throat> and um, and but we always stuck with uh, the whole uh, uh, death and Satan, and, and that goes back to one of my favorite quotes from Jeff Becerra. Um, I read it in the uh, sometime in the eighties. Uh, he said, uh, you know, paraphrase, but it was something like, uh, uh, "Some bands like to sing about death. Some bands like to sing about Satan. We choose to sing about both." And it <laughs> struck me. It, it struck a chord in me, and I thought, "Yeah, just sing about both." And it, and that, and, and oddly enough, or greatly enough, possess still does the same. Death and Satan, and and. Uh, and, and so we, I mean, everyone, you know, there's topics, we've got topics about slots and wars and this kind of yeah. stuff, but it's all mainly stuff, all, yeah. that, all good stuff. Yeah. But yeah. But what was interesting too is like a connection with metal and punk. Um, Cause I know for me growing up, I was always more into hard rock and heavy metal and uh, similar to you, not being able, you know, in the beginning, not understanding how to play the instrument. I'm like, so my parents got me a guitar, right? Like a $70 guitar, start playing around with it, took lessons. I'm like this isn't going anywhere. I need to like do something else. And I started figuring out Black Sabbath songs on one string, you know. Mm -hmm. And then, um, then I realized that punk rock music was something that you can do without really knowing how to play that well, right? Yeah. So then I'm like, okay, I'm doing this. But they they felt very separate, though. You know what I mean? Until I started seeing thrash bands like Cliff Burton, basically. Mm -hmm. You know, the Misfits. <clears throat> bands, yeah. Right? yeah. And. Hardcore bands like the Chromags kind of having like at first time I heard the Chromags, I'm like, it sounds like Black Sabbath, man. Like the beginning of, um, you know, we got to know, right? I'm like, this is like some, this isn't punk, this is a different thing, right? 
And Nunslaughter has like a punk vibe to it, yet it's clearly metal though. You know, and I always Thank wondered you. like what what do you think separates the two? You know what I mean? Like that's like a really interesting question, right? Yeah. I, I'm not sure because I mean the <clears throat> I like the fact that uh, death metal at least when it the, uh, when it began to germinate into death metal <clears throat> had the same disregard for um, uh, the music industry as, yeah. as punk rock did um, basically uh, you know uh, thumbing your nose at them and, and just saying well we don't need you we're going to make music and fuck that all the other shit you know and um <clears throat> That's how I thought that it, they, they both shared uh, a lot of space in at least my brain and in my heart because uh, uh, punk rock, even though you know some, some bands were on labels or big labels and pushed by labels, most of it was being created in a, in a garage or a basement and they were being played in a seedy back bar in the yeah. back, you know, no, in, in no, no, no promotion, no, no, uh, uh, just handwritten flyers and pass them to the people and then all the all the people in the know would show up and that's how a lot of the early death metal stuff was uh, at least in in, uh, in Pittsburgh and I assume in a lot of places you know and then <clears throat> then that kind of changed in the, uh, the, the late 80s early 90s when the scene kind of grew out of it uh, it got it got too big for itself it just couldn't be contained and kind of record industry as a whole kind of started saying hey that uh that seems uh seems like maybe we can push some of these bands and make something out of them but um well i don't, I don't know how they uh just in my head i mean like just on my my vest i'm sure you see i've got like yeah. i got agnostic front discharge and misfits same with i got venom and uh creator and probably metallic on there too <laughs> but uh, yeah i mean and it all seemed like aggressive music but same as same as like you were saying like cliff, cliff burton you know he's always wearing that fucking crimson ghost you oh, know? yeah and i was just like what the hell is yeah. that and that got like that got me into the misfits especially and 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 then you know i would see <laughs> headfield wearing discharge shirts and stuff like, who's discharge go check this shit out you know and uh so it kind of all blended together for me, but uh, yeah, Cliff Burton is. I, I attribute Cliff Burton for even like even know who the Misfits are really. I mean, because like you know, definitely I'm, keeping them alive or yeah. in people's psyche. Well, I mean, where I grew up, I grew up. Malcolm and I actually grew up in the same area. Well, he didn't grow up there. He's from Florida originally, but I lived as a kid in the same area that Malcolm was living. And he had his record shop and everything, trash American style. And, uh, you know, you kind of, back then, without the internet, you kind of had to, like, look to other things. To see. Someone had to show you, led by example. Yeah. You know what I mean? So, The Misfits wasn't in the sort of consciousness of, the, of anyone in the 80s, really, in my area. Mm. You know? And then I started seeing these pictures of Cliff Burton with his sick, like, skull shirt. And then I, I bought Legacy of Metallica, expecting it to sound like Metallica. <laughs> yeah. But then I was like, this doesn't sound like Metallica at all. But I'm like, but... I like it. It's cool, right? <laughs> you know, and then a few years later, Danzig One came out, and I didn't even know about Sam Hain. You know, what I mean, I found out about everything kind of all at once. Mm -hmm. You know, and like that, and it's like once again, it's the same thing. It's like Misfits, Sam Hain, and Danzig, but it's like punk metal, goth, like yeah. weird connections. Everything. Yeah, he 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 did it well. He did yeah. it, all, all three bands. Uh, it, yeah, he's it, it, <laughs> an extremely creative person. So I I think. Uh, I hope people give him a, a, enough credit for, for what he did, especially for, in my heart, the punk rock. But, I mean, his, the, the lyrics, the approach, the horror punk stuff. Yeah. I mean, well, we're, we're going to get to that with you guys, okay. definitely, for sure. Because that's one of, the, one of the things I love the most about um, you know, Nunslaughter is, like, the introduction of using, incorporating horror elements into the music. There's, like, a fine line, you know what I'm trying to say? Like... There's quote unquote horror punk, right? Which I fucking hate most of those bands. <laughs> uh, you know, but because they, it's just a certain subtlety or lack of subtlety in some cases, but 
there's a line that you have to walk mm -hmm. to make the music interesting and not just be like, you know. And I think you guys definitely are one of those bands that have that element in it, but it's not like abrasively hitting you over the head with it. You know what I'm trying to say? Well, thank you. Yeah. yeah. And it's like when I, when I, like I said, Misfits, Sam Hain, you know, early, the non, late night, you know, mid nineties, non-slaughter. That's when I really started checking you guys out. And it was like, oh yeah, these guys sing about like zombies and you know, like vampires and all this other shit too. Yeah. And I'm like, this is like right up my alley, you know? So where did the horror element come? Is it something, have you always been into horror? Did you read the books, comics, like movies, like all that sort of stuff? It was movies and I'm not sure how, I'm not sure why that interested me, but I was, <clears throat> as a kid, pro probably because on the, uh, the newsstands, the magazine, Fangoria was there, and I would have, I would be able to pick up Fangoria and uh, <clears throat> see all these uh, great looking practical effects, and then I'd want to see those movies, and those movies most of them weren't in the, the theater, yeah. so you have to go and rent the video cassette, and I had a, uh, my mom didn't like that kind of crap, but uh, I had a uh, big brother, like through big brothers and big sisters, uh, and um, he was a little more uh, uh, forgiving with the the videos that I wanted to watch, sure, you know. Yeah. And uh, even though I was probably 12, 13, uh, you know, he would he would rent these, these uh, horror movies like you know, Motel Hell and Basket Case and uh, 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 all the the Hammer Horror always fascinating me too. as well. Big fan and, of that uh, stuff. And uh, I remember being in his house. He he would get his uh, family. His he had four four girls that were uh, you know some younger, some older than me. But they you can't watch this, girls. And he'd get them out of. There. And then it would just be me and him sitting there <laughs> watching, you know, drinking drinking all the pop I wanted and eating popcorn and watching all these these horror movies. So it was a real uh, great escape. And I I just I really liked the practical effects. And I remember even before I knew what it was. Uh, watching um, movies like uh, uh, Clash of the Titans. Oh, yeah, and, yeah. Uh, 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 the, the Sinbad movies, all yep. the Ray Harryhausen, mm -hmm. all the stop motion. And I was just fascinated. Like, why does this look so different? I didn't know that it was one frame at a time and he's moving all the shit. I just knew that it looked cool. And I was like, I was like this, is, this is what I like. Then that kind of got me into movies. And then, of course, all the practical effects, you know, uh, I don't really want to see somebody's head get chopped off, but I like seeing it in the movies right. because it's it's uh, it's it's overly done. You know, just blood everywhere. And yeah, it's a we talked about the beast within. Um, oh, yeah. There's a head pulling off scene in there. It's just, he reaches through the wall. And he pulls the guy's head off. <laughs> I remember that in pieces. There's the elevator scene where she's like ah, and the guy flips her arms off, and they they. I mean, it looks like he cut her arms off. Yeah, it's no, freaking well awesome. Done. Yeah. <laughs> So, uh, so yeah, uh, th th those were all topics that uh, I wanted to uh, write about. And, uh, of course, as a, as a kid in high school, uh, you, you had to do the uh, required reading, uh, you know, Scarlet Letter or some shit like sure. this. But, you know, then you find out that, the, well, there's this guy, Edgar Allan Poe. Oh, He's yeah. got creepy. Oh, yeah. <laughs> all these creepy stories. You, know, you, re you start reading them, you're like, man, what's going Like, why does this make me give you chills and stuff and uh, so I try to incorporate those kind of stories into uh, you know uh, uh, the lyrics and most of most of the stuff like uh, Back to Possessed uh, uh, even uh, I like Jeff's lyrics a lot and I, I even like uh, like uh, uh, Venom and Cronus's lyrics most of their lyrics don't don't necessarily tell a story but they're great line after line after line after line yeah I was more into uh, trying to tell a story from sure. beginning to end. Now, maybe some of the rudimentary you know, earlier stuff, I, I was line by line. It was just like, that's a cool line, that's a cool line, it rhymes, that's going in the song. But you get to the end of it, and there was no no story that got told. But as I, as I got better at writing and storytelling, and, and I learned more words, basically, I, I could tell a little story. And it's challenging in Nussar because you got two minutes. <laughs> yeah, it's very short. Yeah, <laughs> you got songs. two minutes, two yeah. and a half. Get the story out. Uh, you know, sum it up. And uh, 
but yeah, that, uh, the, the, the horror movie factored in uh, greatly in my uh, uh, writing, especially the earlier stuff. Did you uh, get into the um, the Vincent Price, uh, like the Roger Corman, like uh, oh. adaptations of Poe's Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, Fitting the Pendulum, those sure, yeah. 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 Excellent music in those movies, yeah, too. Yeah, yeah, that was another thing. A lot of the scores were really neat, you know. You, uh, it, 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 I think the, the passive uh, watcher just sees like a, you know, crappy special effects horror film. I don't want to watch this, but the active and I consider myself an active watcher. I was, you're, you're listening to like, what's what's that? What's all that sound like? Why am I tensing up? You know, and you figure out it's the music that's yeah, making you tense. tense. Yeah, yep. you know, yeah. uh, especially in uh, the uh, was that uh, uh, the uh, uh, car off the, uh, the, the uh, Black Sabbath. Oh yeah. Um, yeah, like there's some just absolutely creepy scenes in that movie, and. Uh, and it's underscored with the score, you know. It, it, it just sounds great. It makes makes the movie creepy, you know. And uh, yeah, Mel, Mel's a. So when when did the move to Cleveland happen? Like, at what point was that? Like, how how established was the band by the time you moved to Cleveland? You know, well, sort of the lineups and all that sort yeah, of. Yeah, there there was we had quite a few releases, but nothing ever very stable. Uh, especially when kids growing up, you, you got. Uh, you getting married, graduating high school, getting married, having kids, going in the army, going to college, <clears throat> uh, moving away for a job, all these life events. So people kept dropping in and out. Sure. They wanted to do music, but I got to get a job, you know, yep. this and that kind of thing. And myself included, I went, I went to college and uh, I tried, I, I kept it going, but it wasn't like, it, it, like there was quite a few years there. It was put out a demo every two years or something like that. It just didn't have the time or nobody wanted to record it with me this kind of thing um, <clears throat> by uh, a very strange coincidence uh, we, we there was a there was a show in uh, in Pittsburgh that um, uh, Vince Vince Crowley uh, Asheron was playing it was more of an angel and Vince Crowley sent uh, flyers out to you know he had a list of people in, in uh, or, you know to try to pull them in to come see Asheron well on that list happened to be uh, Jim Kanye um, and uh, Jim got it the day of the show which was a Saturday Jim somehow for some reason convinced two carloads of people to go down to Pittsburgh to see this more more dangerous show because they weren't playing in Cleveland at the time. they were only playing at the Electric Banana and so when he showed up, <clears throat> I didn't know him at all, but I knew everybody in the <coughs> Pittsburgh music scene, or at least I, I figured I knew most people. And so I saw, you know, seven, eight people that I didn't know, and well, I was kind of gregarious at the time, and I figured they might have some demos I didn't have. So I just went up and started talking to them, and uh, then I ran into Jim, and we started, we, we hit it off, and he just kind of out of the blue and I, I mean I really thought it was like a candid camera uh, where he's just like do you know the, you know a band from around here called Nunslaw and I'm thinking like who put you up to this yeah, you know, right. nobody knows who Nunslaw is he's, just, he's like yeah I got I got the demo and I says that's me and he's like you're shitting me and I'm like no because I thought you I thought you would be living in the woods <laughs> this this is, no. yeah I remember that's what he said so uh, so I went back to went back we walked over his truck and he was showing me all the uh, demos on tape that he had and I was like oh I do need that one and, and uh, you know uh, you know, do you have this no I don't have that well this is our second one you know so we exchanged addresses and we uh, gave each other like a list of stuff that he, I wanted him to send and he wanted me to send and come that Monday apparently we both sent the package immediately and kind of got it on the same day and it was just I mean it was, it was like like school kids were calling up each other like oh, I got that he was laughing and it's like oh look at that shirt you know, and uh, that that just started our, our friendship. So, uh, long story even longer. Um, from that, he was just like, "Hey, if you ever need somebody to, to play on a Nunsauter recording, just let me know." And uh, <clears throat> a couple of years went by, and it just so happened me and the original guitar player for Nunsauter, we wrote a demo, "Face of Face of Evil." We didn't have a guitar, uh, we didn't have a drummer, so I said, "Hey, why don't you come down?" And we spent the whole day uh, recording. Uh, and uh, then Jim was kind of officially in the band. We took band photos and all this stuff. And um, shortly after that, it was ninety. 
I think it was 96, um, I was moving to uh, uh, Florida, and then eventually I went to Hawaii. And uh, <clears throat> That was with the photography <clears throat> we were talking yeah, about. Yeah, yeah videography. Yeah. And, yeah, videography, yeah. Working in Disney World. And, uh, but uh, at that time when I moved, just as I was moving, I got a phone call or a letter from a guy who wanted to put Nunsutter in the studio and, and record an album. And so I said, Jim, you know, would you be able to record it in Cleveland and, you know, you know send me the reels wherever we're at? And he said, sure. So, uh, yeah, he recorded uh, all the music in Cleveland at this uh, studio called Primetime Studios. And he sent me the reels out to Hawaii and I recorded the vocals at a studio called uh, Rendezvous Studios. Um, it was the only two inch analog studio in the islands at all. And, um, <clears throat> And then we sat on them for a while because we wanted to be together when we mixed sure. it. Yeah. And uh, uh, eventually, in Hawaii, my my girlfriend, uh, who eventually became my wife, who became my ex-wife, she wanted to go back to college. And uh, Jim was, and, and while I was there, we actually recorded a couple of demos. And Jim was insisting. He's like, "You should move to Cleveland. We'll we'll start touring. We'll do this band like you know, full time." And uh, so, uh, me and my 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 wife or girlfriend at the time, Heather, were like, well, we were both from Pittsburgh. We don't want to move to Pittsburgh. And Cleveland at the time was was booming. Uh, I was getting uh, I was getting literally the one ads that, from the newspaper, and it was thick, like just job after job after job. Nice. Yeah. So we were like, well, let's just move to Cleveland. So we moved to Cleveland and, uh, um, and uh, yeah, started doing the band. And, and yeah, I think it was, nine, nine, I think, 99. Either ninety nine ninety nine it was Nunsutter's really first official live show that we ever played, and that was due all because of Jim. Yeah, because like I remember, like like I was saying, I started being aware of what the band was about like in the mid nineties around that, but I'd never heard of you guys playing anywhere. Yeah, you know what I mean, and I saw that, so that answered like one of the questions I had is like, you know, what the deal was, and that had to be like what like twelve years ago maybe. Oh yeah, was that with um, like uh, Destroy Dis- Six Six Six? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I remember yeah. that. That was the one I got. Did I, t- I think I told you that I got threatened. The the owner, it was kind of a you know a, Italian owner. Oh yeah, well that yeah. <clears throat> and uh, I had some t shirts taped to the wall, and uh, the owner, uh, you know, a, a, a man of small stature but with a very large bodyguard, <laughs> walked over and whispered something to the bodyguard, and the bodyguard said no tape on the walls and I said okay <laughs> I, got out, I took it down immediately made sure no paint got torn oh, yeah. off and everything and I it, we, we didn't have any problems after that but uh, yeah that, I, I specifically remember that that show yeah that that, was, that sounds like a, a Brooklyn story actually you know <laughs> definitely <laughs> but all this time the band has been independent like you guys never Officially, were releasing stuff as as like um like signed to a label or anything like that. No, like yeah. it's all pretty much been like done in a very DIY like fashion, right? Yeah, um, <clears throat> we did have a, a contract with uh, uh, Repulse Records out of Spain. That n- nothing ever happened with it. He sold the he then he sold the contract to another Spanish label called Revenge Records. Um, but it was it was a label only by label. It wasn't like Metal Blade or anything like yeah. that. He just basically said, "I'll I'll put it out," and he did. And then <clears throat> the uh, the gr- agreement was two records. <clears throat> and after the second record, you know, our a, a contract or it was not really like signing contracts. And, you know, pub- there was no publicity about you know. That's our signs to revenge records. <laughs> it was just, hey, we'll put it out. Okay, so, <clears throat> and then after that, uh, it was just a series of uh, basically licensing deals where yeah. you just say, hey, I've got this recording. Okay, I'll, I'll put it out. Or uh, a lot of times, especially with Jim involved, it would be a, a, a label, and they would front half the money. We would front half the money, and we'd put the usually a seven inch or something like that out. Yeah. Um, and then with Hell's Headbangers in the past uh, almost 20 years, it's just been literally handshake agreements and just head nods and like, hey, you know, we're recording this. You know, you want to put it out? Okay. And they put it out for us. So 
Yeah, no, no real contracts or anything. Yeah. The thing with Hell is Headbanger seems to be pretty, pretty sick. You know, I mean, yeah. I, at that, I pay attention to that label, and like, I know a lot of people. Just the label and the distro and the whole trip is like something that people are really into. You know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Very fortunate. We met those literally when they were, they were kids. They were teenagers, and uh, it, it, Jim kind of took them under his wing, and uh, we helped. By we, I mean Jim and I helped put out the first two. Um, Hell's Headbangers releases because they didn't know what they were doing and uh, we, we, we did the design uh, actually the second second release their first release was Spawn of Satan which was one of Jim's uh, thrash uh, metal projects and then the second one was a split with Nunslaughter and Sentinex and uh, everything from like from the, the, the layout to the, the sending the uh, music in to get pressed is fine Jim and I did all that for them. They basically just wrote the check, and then it came out on Hell's Headbangers. And, uh, yeah, so great relationship. Nunslaw is known definitely for the prolific amount of splits that you guys have, too. Yeah, a lot of them. Like, I'm, like you look and you go to, like, you know, Metal Archives or whatever, and you go to Nunslaw, and it's just, like, this, like, monolithic list of releases <laughs> with split after split after split. Now, I have a question for you. Does there exist a non-slaughter integrity split? No. There That's does something not. that would make a lot of sense to me. Especially would. since you have a, me, a former member former of the band. Former member, yeah, yeah. yeah. But uh, integrity is, they haven't been based in, in Cleveland for yeah. a very long time. In fact, I think it, they weren't even based there when I, when I moved. By the time I got there, it was just like, <coughs> I think it was 99. Um, I think they had already relocated or dwid moved to I think he's Belgium or something like that and uh, so I actually never met I never met him until uh, I think last it was last year the year before we, we played a show with Integrity we, we opened up for him uh, and that was the first time and only time I ever met him oh, um, interesting but yeah that would have been a, that would have been a cool split the other thing is the striking imagery that you guys use on you know t-shirts and album covers split covers like you know what's do you, do you, who does that? That's like artists. Are, yeah, all, yeah. Who are the artists? Like different artists. Oh like yeah, concepts and all that kind of stuff. Lots of different artists, and now with the internet, it's it's so much easier to uh, to get uh, the uh, to find new artists. Uh, before it used to be like you ask your buddy, yeah. you know anybody that draws? <laughs> you know, <laughs> and and you know, okay, you know this guy, you know he can do he can do a a zombie or an upside down cross. You go, okay, well let's use that. Um, and then with the with the internet now, uh, especially with Instagram, there's so many artists on there from all over the world that you can actually see what their artwork looks like. So and and either buy it or have them do something uh, original for uh, for the band. So, but yeah, it's it's a uh, it's it's all over the place. Um, not one artist have we used constantly. <laughs> Why is he? What's going on, Paul? Oh, I see your ass. Oh, it's fine. I'm allowed. <laughs> anyway, talk about art. Yeah, ass, asshole, uh, ass art. Ass art. <laughs> ass cheek art. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, so artists all over the world, and uh, yeah, it's a, uh, it makes it easier. The fucking internet makes it a lot easier. Finding chorus. Hell yeah. Now, as far as like the movies go, we talk about Poe, right? You know, we talked about his writing. We talked about the Vincent Price stuff. Now, I want to get your take on uh, Evil Dead and the remakes and all that sort of stuff. Because I know we talk about horror a lot, too, yeah. on this trip. Yeah. So, yeah, what are your feelings on that? I know there's, a, there's this new Evil Dead movie that came out last year. Yeah, I Thoughts on that? I haven't seen it yet. Uh, but I, it's so difficult. I, I don't understand how, why people want to remake a classic. There didn't seem to be any problems with that movie, so I don't understand why you would remake it. Same with like, uh, like Psycho, uh, being you know Alfred Hitchcock. Um, I don't know why somebody felt the need to remake it. It, it was already a good. It was a good movie. It wasn't like it needed. Uh, 
like there were holes in the plot, and, you right. know, and like ah, you know, I don't know who this Bates guy is. I mean, it's it's fairly well explained. So there's already a good movie. Same with that that Evil Dead. I mean, the only thing I would say is, I mean, I, I would have liked to have seen what it is. The the the, the you know it, it, it the, the the evil manifested itself in different people, but like what is it? And that was really what was what was neat about it. Yeah. It can be it can be your friend, it can be your, your girlfriend, it just it would possess people. And that was cool as shit. Um but all the practical effects and shit, when that fucking vine goes through that chick's Oh dude. But then, <laughs> I, still made, I still feel it. I still I mean I was like, like what the hell kind of movie still am feel I that watching? Pain, man. It uh yeah, so uh, but I haven't seen I haven't seen the remake. Um, isn't there? There's supposed to be a remake of The Exorcist too, dude. And I don't know how that's going to work, man. <laughs> anyone who listens to Necromaniacs, the horror podcast, will know my thoughts about it already. But it, it was I thought it was miserable, man. Oh, it, it, it does exist. Did yeah, it? oh, it oh, oh, came see, out last year, man. I, I didn't see oh. that either. Uh, maybe I'm blissfully ignorant. <laughs> it's, you're probably better off actually. Yeah. Because so you know, so I loved I loved uh, the, the Exorcist. Uh, you know, uh, the regular theatrical cut. And then, you know, blah, 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 X amount of years later, you find out there's a director's cut. Yep. And that's even more sinister. Oh, yeah. How the fuck does that happen? Spider I mean, walk oh, that. man, that, that shit was just creepy as all hell, you know? And uh, so, I mean, it, it even got better. Um, uh, I don't know how they could have, why you decided to remake it. I mean, obviously. Money. You know, everybody, yeah, money or people, you know, everybody's, yeah. Hollywood's out of ideas. They're rehashing, maybe. And I, you know, but so, uh, like the original, the original thing, it was, it was a pretty good movie. And maybe if I was older and saw it originally, you know, on the silver screen, I'd think, why are they, why is this John Carpenter fella making another, the thing, you know? So maybe it's just the point in time that, you know, because there might have been people that never heard of The Exorcist and saw the remake and thought, well, this is a fantastic movie. And they say, well, it's a re oh, it's a remake. Wow. Maybe and they'll go back and watch the original. I don't know. I mean, but uh, the thing was really fucking good. Uh, the John that, Carpenter. Yeah. I mean, I, I like the original is OK, but I, I saw the the. John Carpenter first, then I went back and sure. I did watch the original, but I thought I like this John. There's Carpenter. like that John Carpenter, like it's like I guess they call it the Apocalypse trilogy with like the Thing and Prince of Darkness and uh, uh, Mouth of Madness. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's supposed to be like the end of the world trilogy thing. Really? Like, okay. Yeah, definitely. It's, conceptually, they they all have that sort of connection. You know? Yeah. But uh, but yeah, dude. It looks like we're gonna have to load out soon. So, yeah. Um, thanks for your time, man. Yeah, absolutely. And, uh, we got a few more days left on this tour, but it's been a blast, and I'm really happy to be out with everybody. Me too. Absolutely. Yeah. Totally. Good talking to you, man. Hell yeah. Yeah, baby, you got involved in that bitch Seven swill and Eric, just to be me Christians believe God is in the sky They're fucking ignorant, it's the reason why God gave Christians A nice end Creed A prison for Galatarians Disciples of Christ I hate Christians I hate Christians I hate Christians Is this time to rise and think for yourself Be strong inside, don't ask for help The Christian cross has turned into a crutch They preach salvation, but it won't mean much When the price you pay is your own dignity To bow before a religious effigy To all mankind why won't you listen? I pray to hell Cause I hate Christians Fuck em Yeah, Christians are strong One can never keep Guys and follow me That just me I'm a fool for God I'm for this friend Cause me when I say I am dead I hate Christians Duh